welcome to our studio guests and panelists today and to fellow travelers out in cyberspace thanks to that non-stop stream of zeros and ones my name is peter govetz co-founder of the zero project and moderator of the international conference slash workshop on zero the zero project is a three-stage affair there's a book project there's this associated online event and then there's the in-depth research program but today session number three we welcome two of the contributors to the monograph on zero book project dr john marmish over in california author of among others laughing at nothing humor as a response to nihilism and dr anders eric hochkarspel philosopher here in the netherlands author of among others nagarjuna the central philosophy basic versus we highly recommend both books, which in their own way shed light on the invention of zero. Both speakers will now compare and contrast the concepts of nothingness and emptiness in connection with the invention of zero. Happily, they disagree on the subject so that we may expect some fireworks today. Well, uh, we're, we're very pleased also to introduce our panelists, Professor Jeff Oakes, University of Indiana, and uh, Tiburon Batredo, student and Team Zero intern. John, may I invite you to introduce yourself and to give us a brief presentation of your paper, please? All right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm John Marmish. I teach philosophy at the College of Marin in California. Um, my area of research focuses on the philosophy of nihilism and its various uh, cultural manifestations and my uh, contribution to the monograph on zero uh, examines three thinkers who have traditionally considered to form the first Western school of philosophy. Uh, it's known as the Milesian school because they come from the town of Miletus. Uh, these philosophers are Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes. Uh, what's interesting about these thinkers in relation to the zero project is the manner in which they set a path for future philosophizing in the West, uh, rejecting the productive potential of nothingness, insisting that all reality is rooted in a singular underlying material substance. So um, the basic assumption governing their thinking is something that uh, uh, is that something can't come from nothing. For them, uh, nothingness was associated with complete non-existence, uh, kind of like a, a non-productive lack. Uh, this is in sharp contrast to Eastern views, which associate nothingness or emptiness with creative potential and spiritual peace. Uh, this difference may shed light on why it is that zero was first conceived in the East and in initially rejected by the Greeks. Uh, so what I'll do um, today is I'll present you a brief summary of some of the lines of reasoning that were pursued by the Milesian philosophers, uh, highlighting ways in which they uh, recoiled from nothingness in favor of somethingness. So the Milesians, they're the first school of pre-Socratic philosophy, which is the philosopher uh, philosophical movement that came before um, the great philosopher Socrates. What's novel about this movement was its rebellion against previous mythic and uh, religious thinking, uh, which tended to explain reality in terms of uh, supernatural forces and uh, entities. Uh, in much of uh, the mythic thought during this period, um, the world is heaved into existence out of nothingness by the power of some sort of God. Um, now, the problems with this mythic sort of account of the world is twofold. Uh, first, it doesn't tell us where the supernatural entities themselves come from. And second, it doesn't explain the mechanism by which nothingness became something. And so you can see if if uh, mythic and religious thought doesn't uh, give explanations of those things, uh, it doesn't really give one, an explanation of where everything came from, and two, it doesn't tell us how all of these things came into existence. And so it's a kind of dissatisfaction with um, those weaknesses that presumably led the pre-Socratics away from uh, mythic and religious uh, storytelling uh, towards offering naturalistic, logical, and materialist explanations for reality. 
And the strength of materialism um, is that it helps to avoid the unpredictability and the kind of instability uh, of explanations about things that come from nothingness. Since nothingness doesn't have predictable patterns or governing laws, um, it, if the universe did come out of nothingness, then it would be filled with volatile mystery. Uh, material substances, on the other hand, possess noble, tangible sorts of qualities that are relatively stable and regular. Um, so if the world is made of material substances, then it would possess a kind of regularity and predictability uh, that human beings would be able to comprehend. And so with the Milesians, um, by replacing the void with matter, um, they shifted emphasis away from nothingness as the generative source and directed it towards a particular thing uh, that's substantial, and tangible, and perceptible. So nothing was replaced with something by these thinkers. Uh, and that, uh, in the Milesian case, that uh, something was one thing. Instead of zero being the starting point, then you could say that all things began in one material substance. So the first of these thinkers um, who existed somewhere around 600 BC was Thales of Miletus. Um, he's traditionally considered to be uh, the first of the pre-Socratics. Um, it was Aristotle who tells us that um, Thales' biggest innovation was the claim that all is water. Now you might say, what's, what's so great about the claim that all is water? It's not true. Um, but Aristotle um, uh, claims that what's so important here is that um, by claiming that all is water, what Thales has done is he's taken something um, that is predictable, um, something that can take on different forms, such as liquid and solid and gas, and um, shown that these um, particular qualities can um, explain the diversity of things around us in reference to simply one underlying substance that's ruled by the laws of nature. So this gives a kind of systematic and predictable explanation for the world around us. Um, so to say that all is water in its deepest, uh, is, that all is water in its deepest essence um, is to say that everything is one thing and that this one thing has knowable properties and qualities that are subject to natural laws. Now, it was Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, much later, who told us that this naturalism and this materialism that we find in Thales um, is what made him a scientist. But what really made him a philosopher, according to Nietzsche, was the claim that all things are one thing. Now, this claim is rooted in his assertion that all is water, but it kind of goes beyond that as well in asserting this kind of non-empirical generalization concerning cosmic unity. Um, it's, it's this monistic view, conceiving of the cosmos as one thing that initiates the Western philosophical tradition. So in his attempt to conceptualize being as a singular whole rather than as an opposition between being and nothingness, um, Thales becomes the author of a perspective that's endorsed by an entire tradition of thinkers up through present times. Now, um, the student of Thales was Anaximander, and he's considered the second of the Milesian school. Aristotle tells us that what's extraordinary about Anaximander is that he used logic in order to tease out a kind of inconsistency in Thales' uh, watery monism. Um, if all things come from one thing, then this implies that the multitude of things that exist around us must somehow, according to this line of reasoning, be capable of resolution back into the one from which they arose. There has to be some sort of bridge, in other words, between the many and the one. So if we accept Thales' speculation that all is water, it should follow that the multitude of things in our world, so things like air, fire, earth, water, um, that all of these things should be harmonious and continuous with water, but they're not. <laughs> this is the empirical fact. Fire and water, for instance, conflict with one another. So if there's a lot of water, extinguishes a lesser amount of fire, and if you've got a lot of fire, it vaporizes a lesser amount of water. Um, it would seem to follow then that if all is water, all fire would have been extinguished. Yet fire does exist. The conclusion that has to be reached then, according to Aristotle's reconstruction of Anaximander's thought, is um, that a, a water cannot be the singular origin of everything. 
So if this is the line of reasoning, then from it, one could plausibly conclude that things do not in fact arise from one single source at all, but from many. And yet Anaximander recoils from that conclusion, instead retaining the assumption that there must be one singular unitary underlying substance at the ground of all reality. So my question is, why, why retain that assumption? And we do find a clue in Aristotle. Um, Aristotle tells us that perhaps this is the line of reasoning. If there is a finite diversity of conflicting elements in existence, they would have to, as Aristotle puts it in physics, always balance in order to avoid the sort of eradication that I discussed previously, the eradication of one of the um, uh, conflicting elements over the other. If there was a tip in any direction, like more water, more fire, more air, more earth, that would result in the most common element prevailing over the others. But if the elements are all finite and balanced, okay, additionally, then it would be impossible for them to fill infinity, since there would always be a remainder of nothingness left over. So a finite number of elements can't fill an infinite space. Uh, uh, therefore, all things cannot come from numerous finite elements, nor can they come from one of the elements in infinite quality. Excuse me, infinite quantity. Okay. So the three assumptions, there's three assumptions that guide this line of reasoning. One is that the universe is infinite. Two, earth, air, fire, and water exist as discrete opposed elements. And three, nothingness doesn't exist. Now, Anaximander could have abandoned any one of those assumptions, but he chose instead to retain them all. Um, he went on to reason that the uh, world thus constituted must be one infinite, invisible substance, not opposed to any of the finite visible elements, but which supports and underlies them all. Since such an infinite substance would leave, have to be capable of sustaining opposing, seemingly contradictory elements, it has to be ambiguous in makeup, neither fully earth, air, water, or fire. And he called this substance a pyron. Um, the boundless, the unlimited, the infinite, or the indeterminate. Lots of different translations of this. A pyron is eternal, uncreated, and immortal. It never came into existence, and it cannot go out of existence. It's a singular source of all things. Now, there's only one single fragment from Anaximander's writing which still exists, and I'll read the translation that Heidegger gives in his work on Anaximander. Um, this is the, the fragment, the Anaximander fragment. Whence things have their origin, there they must also pass away according to necessity. For they must pay penalty and be judged for their injustice according to the ordinance of time. Now, what is it that Anaximander intends when he claims that the things in this world, quote, must pay penalty and be judged for their injustice according to the ordinance of time? Now, according to Heidegger, according to Heidegger's work, this is the, the most important part of the fragment, and he even claims it's the only authentic part of the fragment. But it's also puzzling because in contrast to the uh, materialism and the naturalism found in the, um, in the rest of Anaximander's thought, these words introduce an ethical or a moral dimension into Anaximander's thought by talking about justice, okay? paying, paying a penalty. So if we look at the structure of the fragment, it appears to have the form of an argument. The second part of the fragment, the part that makes the moral claims, that's the part that um, talks about judgment and injustice, um, that seems to constitute the premise. And the first part of the fragment, the part that um, is focused on physics, the origins of things, um, constitutes the conclusion. So if this is correct, then Anaximander is arguing that the reason why things have to pass back into that from which they came is because those same things are unjust and must be judged to pay a penalty. The existence of things is a corruption or uh, and a necessary penalty has to be paid for reabsorption uh, by reabsorption into the infinite. So my question now is, what's the injustice? What is wrong with things that emerge out of a pyron? Uh, why must they be judged and return to their origins? Now, if we go to Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche suggests that the injustice that Anaximander is calling our attention to is, quote, befall from being to coming to be, unquote. 
So as things separate out from the infinity of a pyron, they fall from being, moving from the realm of the eternal and the stable into a state of impermanence and flux. So it's this fall that constitutes the injustice that has to be penalized precisely because it's a degradation of a pyron's magnificent unity. Um, in other words, the preferred most noble mode of existence, according to Anaximander, is the stable, unified presence of being itself. And it's not the ephemeral and stable state of flux and change. To be then in this fullest, most legitimate sense is to remain stable and fixed, just like a pyron itself. Uh, the various temporary things that appear in our world then are unjust and must be judged due to, their, due to their ephemerality and their lack of permanence. So this just raises another question for me. Why is stability more just than instability and change? What's so great about unchanging being and what's so wrong with impermanence? And it's here, I think, that we encounter the crux of the issue. Western philosophy, beginning at least with the Milesians, has stood firm in the belief that it's better to be than not to be. And so that which exists in the most stable and permanent fashion is better and more just than that which exists in a less stable or less permanent fashion. This uh, appears to be the case because stability on the one hand is equated with being, while change on the other hand is equated with nothingness. Nothingness, now that's the real enemy here. Standing in opposition to this noble uh, being, nothingness steals something away from it. Um, it kind of degrades and erodes uh, its integrity, acting like a negative force of destruction. Thus, whatever allows the scourge of nothingness to creep into our world acts as an accomplice in a crime against being, you could say. Um, and this is what temporary changing ephemeral things do. While they partially exist, Things that come into and go out of existence also partially don't exist. Um, so they're, they kind of hover in this indeterminate state between reality and illusion, opening the door to the void and inviting non-being to make an appearance. And it's this, for Anaximander, that seems to be unjust. This is the insult that has to be punished. So for the sake of time, um, I'm going to pass over the third of the Milesian thinkers, Anaximenes, except I'll say that for him, nothingness also doesn't exist. For him, our universe consists of more or less densely packed air that crowds out the void and occupies the infinity of existence. And so for him, just like for Thales and Anaximander, the universe is based on the one. The many are just modifications of the one. Um, so some concluding um, points here. The Milesians equated being with unitary, eternal, noble stability on the one hand, and nothingness with unjust impermanence on the other. And it's this equation that initiated Western philosophy's fear of nothingness. Um, the Western tradition generally holds that being is better and more just than non-being, precisely because being is stable and present. But why, are being, why is uh, uh, our stability and presence better than non-stability and non-presence? Why not value non-existence over existence? Well, the answer for Westerners is traditionally found in this presumed negativity and destructiveness of non-existence. Whereas Eastern thought has tended to find something creative and productive in nothingness, Westerners have tended to see it as a dead end, uh, a dreadful lack out of which nothing at all can be generated. So the assumption that nothingness is inevitably partnered with oblivion seems to be the root of the common Western contention that out of nothing comes nothing. The fear of nothingness originates out of this assumption. Nothingness is fearful because it's at odds with and thus threatens the integrity of being. Um, it was Nishida who claimed that uh, the West has considered being as the ground of reality and the East has considered nothingness as its ground. Uh, in the West, philosophies that embrace nothingness have tended to be disparaged as nihilistic, suggesting that uh, they perversely value non-existence over existence, but that because of this, they're also permeated with a dark negativity that's kind of hostile to life. Um, they're non-creative, they're non-constructive in their insights. So if nothing comes from nothing, then to embrace nothingness, according to this way of thinking, is to embrace absolute oblivion and extinction. It's to abandon all hope 
for progress or positive creation. Um, in the East, on the contrary, nothingness has traditionally been regarded as something to embrace, precisely because it's associated with productive potential. Uh, in this, we find an affirmative understanding of absolute nothingness. In order for things to come into being, there already must exist an emptiness within which they make their appearance. This emptiness is the backdrop uh, against which the entirety of the empirical world unfolds. And as uh, authors such like uh, D.T. Suzuki, Houston Smith point out, nothingness conceived in this way is it's not really negative or unjust, but indicative of, as they put it, a boundless life itself. And this is a far cry from the nihilistic nothingness that was feared by the Milesian philosophers. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> you, you answer a lot of questions, but you raise a lot of other questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we'll get into that uh, as we progress. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, I'll now ask uh, Eric to take the floor, please. Okay. Well, um, I've been um, studying um, phenomenology um, um, the latest years. I've been studying transcendental phenomenology. And besides, I have been uh, studying... Um, Nagarjuna and translated uh, his work from Sanskrit, um, as Peter already mentioned. So um, I don't want to speak about the uh, psychological um, reasons uh, um, for creating or inventing the zero, but um, I want to follow the pathway from the father of phenomenology, Edmund Husserl, who has analyzed the process of the constitution, the Stiftung, as he calls it, of the zero. Um, what he says, he says, well, zero is a um, symbolic, is, is, is an abstract concept which has no uh, meaning by its own because uh, well we have seen in, in countless other uh, contributions to um, um, the monograph that um, the zero comes in three shapes it is a quantity then it's uh, equivalent to um, emptiness or absence uh, it is a placeholder which is only used for uh, writing so that is um, not very interesting and it is a number and a number has only meaning uh, in the context of arithmetic or in a broader context of, of mathematics and then it's an element which uh, obtains its significance uh, solely by its use, by its relations to other elements of the system. So Husserl tries to find out, to analyze how such a symbolic uh, element can be made uh, part of our uh, symbolic makeup, makeup of the world, our um, uh, symbolic uh, institution. And he distinguishes uh, four steps. Um, the first one is uh, um, an event which has no connection to history at all, because it's a contingent. It starts with a flash. Someone uh, suddenly experiences a change in perspective and sees clearly that the zero is in fact just a number like all others. Then the second step is that the, this person starts to remember this moment and realize it to be uh, a new point of view. The third step is that this new discovery becomes a concept that he or she implements while practicing arithmetic or mathematic. And in this way, it develops into more or less solid theory. And finally, the discovery is ready to be dis discussed with colleagues, one of which could have been uh, our famous Brahma Gupta, 
who uh, wrote it down. The, com the constitution is completed when the theory is written down or formalized as a part of the oral tradition, as was the case with earlier um, Indian mathematics. One of the consequences of a constitution is that the historical occasion of it, which, which is called the context of discovery by philosophy of science, is covered up by the context of justification. The constituted concept becomes, concept becomes obvious. It seems like it has always existed, except perhaps in a very distant and primitive part. So the zero as we use it today um, is possible by two factors. First, it is fixed in writing. And secondly, we have the knowledge and, and capability to uh, understand and implement its written symbol. And this together constitutes the paradigm. Both are necessary if you want to make sure that the students today don't have to discover the number zero from scratch every year again. They need textbooks and they need to go to college. Well, um, the zero originally refers to absence, but it is not absence as such. It is absence of something. If you run out of breath, there is zero breath. And then the, the zero refers to the absence of breath. And we can summarize all those situations by saying that the zero is the absence of that which we're accounting. Or in other words, the zero is as a quantity is the absence of something we expect to find and its emptiness expressed by a mathematical symbol. It is not nothingness because it is impossible to become aware of nothing. Consciousness has to be consciousness of something. When it be, would be conscious of nothing, it would turn into a lack of consciousness. When you're thinking about something and you suddenly realize there was a moment of nothingness, there is a gap in your memory. And if you can remember that moment, there need to be something to remember. So the obvious conclusion there is that you just have dozed off. Well, um, the word emptiness has made a stunning career in Buddhism. And uh, that's where, in fact, uh, that's started the whole project of Zero. From early on, the texts have warned not to interpret the term as a number or a quantity. There is a translation by Edward Kanze of the, probably the oldest text about emptiness, which is called the Prashtaparmita Ratna Gunasam Jayagata, which is dated at least from the first century before Common Era. And there it says, quote, what is this wisdom, whose and whence he queries? And then he finds that all these dharmas are completely empty. And a little bit further on, to imagine these skandhas, which are kinds of dharmas, phenomena, as being empty means to course in the sign, the track of non prediction ignored. And further on, all dharmas are not really there. Their essential original nature is empty. To comprehend that is the practice of wisdom, perfection, supreme." Unquote. So, to course in the sign is in fact what we're doing when we're practicing mathematics. Uh, so, according to this uh, text, the empty, the, this is uh, just missing the point. Emptiness is in the text a very important concept because it is used 15 times. And um, the question is now, so what is the real meaning of the word emptiness, which is very important for the Buddhist redemption? 
Well, in the text, it is called a wisdom. So it's not just information. It is something one must understand. It is even called the highest wisdom, the Prajna Paramita. Someone who understands it will find that all these dharmas or phenomena are completely empty. So once this emptiness is, is understood, it becomes obvious that everything that reveals itself through our consciousness is in fact empty. All dharmas means again all phenomena, everything that appears to me, to us. Well, we can notice that normally phenomena are not looking very empty. They're supposed to reveal something that is material. They're supposed to be the effects of solid matter. The chair we're sitting on or you're sitting on is not empty, uh, nor is your body that rests on it. So how is it possible that a kind of wisdom suddenly evaporates all this kind of solid matter? It is also said that the phenomena are originally empty. So they may not appear to be empty at the moment, but they only do so if they appear according to their original nature. In other words, this wisdom comprehends phenomena in their original nature. It is not just imagining, because someone who imagines phenomena to be, phenomena to be empty, for instance, by considering that they are composed of electromagnetic str strings, which is the current scientific model, is just missing the point. Now, um, the real um, um, career of the word emptiness is, um, has been caused by um, an Indian philosopher by the name of Nagarjuna, who lived in the middle or a little bit later of the second century after date. His most famous work is the Mula Majamika Karikas, the verses about the root of the doctrine of the middle. Now, Nagarjuna himself, curiously, does not refer to the Prashna Parameter tradition. But in the Karikas, he uses the word emptiness, shunyata, 20 times, and he, use, and he uses the word empty 30 times. But he puts the word between brackets. Quote, all which is dependently originated, we call emptiness. This is a figure of speech. This indeed is the middle way. Nagarjuna agrees with the teaching of the Prashna Paramita tradition. But he doesn't want to call it a doctrine. He doesn't want to see it as a set of propositions that are to be explained and just to justified verbally by the means of logic. Quote, the Victoria ones, the Buddhas, have declared emptiness to be the transcendence of all doctrines. They have said, however, that those who adhere to a doctrine of emptiness are incurable. A little further on, emptiness that has been misunderstood can cause the downfall of an unintelligent person, like a wrongly pronounced magic spell or a snake grasped at the wrong end." Unquote. So what does Nagarjuna mean by the um, term emptiness? Well, he says they are sunyata, svava, svabhava sunyata, which means they're empty of self-existence or of, of, of substance. What appears in dependency on something else, that does not exist by itself. It is like a shadow that disappears when you change the light. The cause that makes a phenomena appear substantially is said to be twofold. First, it is lack of wisdom. And secondly, it is clinging to a substantial self of things and persons. This is what the Buddha originally called thirst or tanha, tr uh, trishna. The Prashna Paramita 
tradition does not deviate from this teaching of the Buddha. And this is testified by a lot of uh, quotes into the text of this tradition from the Buddha himself. So this is um, the meaning of the Sunyata in Buddhist texts. Now the million dollar question is here, where does the zero come in? And now I have to spoil the party because I didn't find any single connection, both in the Ratnaguna Samjaya Gata and in the Mula Majamaka Karika, the words emptiness and empty do not have any mathematical or arithmetical meaning. They don't refer to an absence of things, they don't refer to a quantity, and both stresses, sources stress that it is not a concept nor even something that is imaginable or representable. Emptiness is not a doctrine. It transcends both logic and language. It is, I would say, an avoidable, an unavoidable metaphor for a meditation experience that will in due time become a living experience. The emptiness in the Prajnaparamita tradition and in the Mula Majamika Karikas is not a thing among other things, nor even a phenomenon among other phenomena. It is what phenomena, phenomena uh, just call phenomenality, the way phenomena phenomenalize. Um, now, I have some remarks about the tetralemma, or in, in, in Sanskrit, the chatuskoti. Uh, um, there is a, a scientist who uh, did a very nice job to um, um, investigate the uh, a meaning of the uh, tetralemma is uh, Professor Graham Priest, and he um, his solution was that uh, the uh, emptiness requires uh, the tetralemma requires um, contra uh, consistent logic. Now, I have some problem with this because. The experts who invented contra-consistent uh, contra, uh, con, contra logic all lived in the late 19th century. And um, Nagarjuna lived only in the second century. So this seems to be a kind of Whig history. Uh, and um, it's, it's nice for, for logicians, but it doesn't tell us anything about the meaning of um, uh, emptiness. My conclusion is that um, the, zero, uh, the zero started out as a sign referring to a quantity, and it still is in many of our dealings with it. It was used first as a, uh, it was later used as a placeholder but that did not affect its identity, nor the arithmetic, so that is of minor importance. The big jump is the constitution of Kalkoli, where numbers are not quantities anymore, but elements whose meaning is defined by their place in the system. Kalkoli were made complete when the, system, when the zero was uncertain and the mathematicians, mathematicians became aware of its special qualities. It's important to uh, stress that even Husserl already uh, stressed that such an event is not influenced by historic or anthropological or social uh, events because it is something new. It is something in, uh, unexpected. It is just out of the order. It is unpredictable. Zero as a quantity is associated with emptiness, the experience of missing something you expect to find. As a number, it cannot be 
associated with emptiness, nor with anything else for that matter, because in a calculus, every number itself is empty, because it, uh, it has to, it pretends to have a value of its own, while it in, uh, in reality is totally dependent on the system and the other numbers. It is however certain, and it is attested by several verses Nagarjuna wrote, that he was not involved in mathematics, but practiced Buddhist meditations in the Prajnaparamya tradition. Where the experience of phenomenality as emptiness is an important step to Nirvana. Therefore, the connection between, between the development of Kalkali and Nagarjuna's metaphor of emptiness is non-existent and the idea is an example of superficial rigorous history. Thank you. That was all. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you're now both given an opportunity to ask questions of each other, the two speakers, uh, um, John of Eric and Eric of John. Uh, John, do you have any questions for Eric? Um, so emptiness then is unthinkable. Um, I take it that's uh, the, uh, one of the points that you're establishing. I'm curious um, if you have any thoughts on this distinction that people like uh, Nishitani uh, make between relative nothingness and absolute nothingness. It seems like it may be um, uh, parallel to your um, thought about taking away versus, um, you know, the uh, the pre-existent sort of nothingness, which is unthinkable. Um, the Kyoto school of uh, philosophers, they uh, equate emptiness with this absolute nothingness rather than with the relative nothingness of taking the things away. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, thank you, John. Um, well, I'm not very uh, impressed by the writings of um, Nishida. Uh, if you go to Japan and you ask for the Kyoto School, nobody has any, ever heard about it. It has become the darling of a progressive theologians. And um, I can say that um, uh, these guys who were very much influenced by Hegel and Fichte and Heidegger, um, were very knowledgeable about Indian philosophy. So they mix up Indian philosophy and China, Chinese philosophy, especially their darlings, uh, Zhuangzi, which you didn't understand, and uh, Lao Tzu, who uh, never has been a historical person. Um, one, uh, uh, what, what I, I understand about what uh, Nishida was telling, talking about was the uh, difference between ontological emptiness and uh, ontic emptiness. Well, the ontic emptiness you find, for instance, in the, the, the Tao Te Ching, where it says that, uh, well, the meaning and the use of a crutch is uh, by its emptiness, because it can contain water and, uh, and, and the, the, the use of a house is that it has doors and windows. So, um, but this is just absence of things. And if you say that there is ontological emptiness, then you have to go to Heidegger, who is desperately trying to make sense of what he means by being which he totally uh, takes out of the, um, uh, the context of uh, Greek philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy. And um, in fact, uh, I, I've read that some experts, American experts who tried to uh, translate Heidegger's work had very much pains to figure out what he was actually meaning by the word being. And they came out with something like well, meaningful presence. But um, in the, the, the phenomenology of Husserl and later his followers, Merleau-Ponty and uh, Marc Richier, there is no being at all. Even the late Husserl rejects the concept of being and replaces it with the concept of appearing, which is a much more dynamic and um, which is in fact, more akin to our own experience. 
Does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm sort of caught between the devil and the deep blue, blue sea here. I, I'd love to hear you talk about all these things, tease them out. But uh, we have to, you know, we're already at 45 minutes and we're pushing an hour. So, and Jeff and Tibu still have to get come to bat. Uh, can I can I yeah. ask one small question? Of of John, you may yes. To John, yeah. Yeah, please. Sure. Well, um, the, the the first thing already uh, when I read your uh, article was why didn't you bring in Heraclitus? He is the most prominent of all Milesian philosophers. Um, I think, well, he is, he is, he is not a, uh, he's a bit of an odd one out, but Eric, your, your uh, question. he is very important for uh, ancient Greek philosophy. Eric, your, your question is clear. John, uh, why did you, why did you not bring in Heraclitus? Um, why, for the focus on beginnings, on uh, origins, um, you know, the uh, Thales and Anaximander and, um, and Anaximenes, you know, are conventionally thought to be the, you know, the, um, the beginnings of, um, of uh, Western thought, you know, in all the classes that we teach in Intro to Philosophy, we begin with the pre-Socratics, um, you know, those three pre-Socratics and then move forward. Um, so, you know, for that reason alone, um, uh, started with them. Also, you know, um, uh, you're right. I mean, Heraclitus is, uh, is important. Her Heraclitus, um, you know, as far as my understanding of Heraclitus, um, also claims that despite the impermanence of appearances and such, that, um, all is one. So, um, I suppose. No, no. Logos. Logos is not all things. The oneness of the, 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 the universe is from war, struggle. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then, mm -hmm. he cannot do away with things. He doesn't need things. I think um, you're right, of course, with this um, uh, tendency to, to, to uh, stress being. But I think the real culprit is Parmenides here and later Plato this posh writer who didn't uh, understand Socrates at all. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, we're, we're veering off. Very interesting. And we should come back to that in another episode. But um, let's now go give our uh, two uh, panelists an opportunity to take, uh, to ask questions. Uh, Jeff, can we start with you? May uh, will you just briefly in introduce yourself and then address uh, either or both of the speakers? <clears throat> Sure. Yeah, um, my, I'm Jeff Oaks. I'm a mathematics professor at University of Indianapolis, and I specialize in uh, history of mathematics, in particular medieval Arabic mathematics. So I have very brief questions, which I hope will generate very brief answers. So uh, for John, I have two, two quick questions. One is, when a Greek philosopher such as Aristotle talks about generation and corruption, when they, or when they talk about the coming to be and passing away, are these objects they think of coming to be out of nothing or are they coming to be out of some other material which is transformed into the things that, that, that they become? And, and likewise for the, for the next one. I, I, I believe that um, you know, what, uh, what, they're, uh, what they're describing is, the, uh, is not creation out of nothing, but coming to be out of something. Yes. Okay. So, so as far as material things are concerned, nothing is really being created or destroyed. It's just something whose essence comes to be and passes away, I suppose, something like that. Okay. Yep, and the other, very brief, yeah, the other very brief question I have is, uh, you, you quoted Heidegger for, uh, for the translation of the one passage. And I'm just curious to know if, uh, if modern historians of philosophy differ with Heidegger at all, and why, why Heidegger's viewpoint might be considered uh, as preferable. Um, I, I chose this uh, because it was the passage I was working with from okay. his translation. So yeah, there was, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, there are other uh, translations. Yeah, I, I just didn't know if there was uh, another interpretation that, that might have contradicted Heidegger. Because Heidegger had his own uh, 
agenda. Well, I should yeah. say, I mean that in a negative sense, but he had his own his own ideas about what he was looking for. So he mm -hmm. might have read something there that other people might not. That was my only question there. Well, I would point out that I would point out that other translators also might have their own agendas. Well, no, of course they do. But I, I would. You know, I'm the sort of person who would look at all the translations and try to make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. so, any, anyway, so anyway, thanks for that. So, mm -hmm. so for Eric, I guess the only question I have, uh, since your your area of research is so far from mine, it was hard for me to generate questions. But I do have one. You mentioned that number number uh, zero as a number was born when people uh, began to look at numbers in a relational sense. That rather than being defined according to their being, they would be defined according to their relationships with one another, perhaps through axioms or rules. And, I'm, and, and you didn't mention when and where you, 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 you thought that that transformation occurred. I'm just curious to know. Uh, yes, well, uh, there are two equations, of course. Uh, the first one uh, has been documented, documented in, in the uh, monograph, which is a uh, moment when Brahma Gupta realized that uh, people had been using the zero as a number and ran into difficulties and tried to give rules to avoid those problems. And um, the second, second time it was realized in, in European history would have been um, in the 17th, 17th century uh, by this all this, this, this modern uh, physicist like uh, Galilei, Galileo and um, Descartes and Pierre Gassendi and, and, and those uh, guys and Christian Huygens and uh, okay. all those. Uh, I don't know if this has occurred earlier, probably it has occurred earlier in, in, uh, in the Arab countries when they took over the zero from India. But I don't know anything about that. Okay. Well, I'll leave you in the dark for the moment. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John and Eric. Uh, Tibu, may I invite you to introduce yourself and then uh, briefly address uh, the other two speakers? Tibu. Definitely. Um, so my name is Tibu Don Bacieta, or Tibu, uh, pronouns he, him. And I'm a student slash intern at Project Zero I'm from California in the United States. Um, and I work on different aspects of research, activism. So, um, so I guess my first question for John um, is kind of talking about like Thales and the idea that there's this one substance that can explain uh, the materials like all around us, um, Thales as water. And I'm, I'm curious, how does Thales see water differ from you know, a conception of God or some sort of like mystic deity? Oh, I think that's an excellent uh, uh, question. And in a sense, I do think that um, if you think of God as um, the origin of all things in the universe, um, there is uh, there is a sense in which water could be thought of as Thales' God. It's not um, a Judeo-Christian conception of God, which is separate from the universe or that which brought the universe into existence out of uh, out of nothingness. Um, it's more, I guess you might say, pantheistic. That water is every everything is water. And so, yeah, I think that's a very, a very interesting um, insight that the uh, water is um, uh, plays the role, you might say, of that type of god in uh, Thales' thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and then a question for actually both speakers, because um, I know John, you kind of evenly divide kind of thinking into like east-west um, mm -hmm. styles and conceptions of of zero. Um, so I guess kind of two questions for both speakers. One, are there like areas and cultures that may not fit this exact sort of splitting the East and West styles of thinking? Um, and then two, I guess for Eric too, um, do you see any use in, you know, dividing um, thinking and, and categorizing it into, into East and West, um, specifically about zero? Um, I would just say that, yeah, maybe it is an oversimplification, especially these days, to talk about, um, you know, east-west as a kind of binary um, divide, since there's so much, you know, overlap, um, you know, intercultural uh, overlap. But I would defer to Eric um, on the second part of the question about other um, ways of thinking about that. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think the differences are, uh, well, heavily overrated. 
I can give you counters of uh, uh, examples from Indian philosophy, which are very materialistic and shunning emptiness like hell. Uh, also, as I said, um, the in Taoist tradition, uh, the emptiness is different. The concept of emptiness is different from the one Nagarjuna brought in, and even in Chinese have two different words for it. Uh, in in the Taoist emptiness, the antical emptiness is called Wu, and uh, the um, uh, Buddhist emptiness is called Kong. Uh, which has more the meaning of openness. Um, of course, in Japan, these differences are blurred again because the Japanese don't always understand the Chinese very well, and certainly not the Indians. So, um, it, the first people who started to study Asian texts were not very aware, aware of those subtleties, and they just saw only the big difference between East and West. And I've even noticed that some uh, Jewish philosophers thought that they were different from uh, Western philosophy, like Levina and Derrida uh, several times uh, referred to their being not Western and more Eastern and more in the point of uh, being able to criticize Western philosophy. But if you go into Western philosophy, then you find countless examples of philosophers who were sympathetic to emptiness. I mean, if you really, uh, if you, you look at the um, cynic and the skeptical schools, then you find that they're very open to nihilism and emptiness and other things. Thank you, Tibu. We'll, we'll cut it short for there for the moment, if we may, because we have a little teaser at the end that uh, you know we'd like to conclude this and all sessions with a brief survey to gauge just general trends among all of the contributors uh, if you would reply in a single sentence okay keep remembering that a single sentence to the following three questions and you each got a shot at it uh, let's start with John again same sequence John Eric uh, Jeff and Tibu Question number one, was the numeral zero discovered or invented? John. The numeral zero was discovered, invented. <laughs> okay. Uh, Eric, discovered? It just, it just happened. Okay. Uh, Jeff? Well, I would just say it was invented. Someone decided that there has to be a symbol to put where there is uh, no power of 10, and they just made one up. Right. Okay, Tibu, discovered or invented? I think there are elements of, of both discovery. <laughs> okay, okay. Second question, was this transition, this perceived trans transition between the placeholder zero and the numeral zero, was it a gradual evolutionary process or a disruptive moment in history? John. It was gradual. Uh, Eric. I don't think there's any um, uh, transformation at all. I think this placeholder is totally irrelevant. Okay. Jeff. Uh, happened in a couple stages in my view. Uh, the first was when people began to uh, look, operate on zero in a formal way without assigning any particular meaning to it. And then later when they decided to axiomatize mathematics, I'm talking about 17th, 18th century now, then, then they, they, they realized they needed an element which was, had just the same validity for existence as all the other numbers in, in an abstract system. So first okay. it, was, it was a formalism and then it became axiomatized. Right, right. Uh, Tibu, uh, uh, was was the uh, uh, transition was it a gradual evolutionary process or a disruptive moment in history? I think gradual. Okay, and finally, this is a controversial issue that uh, basically John and Eric addressed: is the concept of nothingness or emptiness is it trivial or profound? John, Nothing, nothingness is among the most profound human issues. Eric? I agree. 
Jeff? I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I can only agree because uh, it's it's certainly beyond my capacity to think about right now. Tibu? Yeah, I think definitely profound. Profound, okay. All right. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us today. It was a very stimulating discussion. Uh, it'll be kind of a challenge for uh, Kevin now for our video uh, videographer to uh, mold this into a, an acceptable video for, for uh, outside consumption as well. So please tune in the week after next to explore related issues to pin, pinpoint, if possible, Zero's epicenter. When did it first see the light of day, as it were? And in doing so, you'll be helping us to draft a roadmap for further research. So until next week, when we meet Dr. Marina Ville, University of Paris, and Dr. Avinash Satae, University of Kentucky, <clears throat> on the very controversial question of whether we can divide by zero or not. So thank you again. Mm -hmm.